All right, I will call this uh, session of the Senate Judiciary Committee to order. Will the secretary please call the roll? Senator Harris. Here. Senator Orenshaw. Here. Senator Dondero Loop. Here. Senator Nguyen. Here. Senator Hansen. Here. Senator Krasner. Here. Senator Stone. Here. Chair Scheibel. Here, thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of items on our agenda for today. Um, and we are going to start with our work session. Um, you can see the list of bills on work session on your agenda. And I think the work session document is also available on Nellis. Um, so we have five bills on work session. Um, four of them, the, the last four, don't have any amendments. So I plan to take those on a consent calendar if everybody is agreeable. Um, you don't have to let me know right now. Just let me know before we get to the consent calendar. And the other bill that we have on work session today is SB 34. Uh, we just received a revised amendment to that one, um, which is reflected in the work session document. It's um, three pages long and it's like pages three through six of, of your packet. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to our policy analyst, Pat Guinan, to walk us through the work session document um, right now. <clears throat> Excuse me, thanks Chair Scheibel, Patrick Guinan for the record. Uh, as the Chair said, we have five bills. The first is not on the consent calendar, it's SB 34. Um, this is a bill that was sponsored by this committee on behalf of the Attorney General. It was heard here on March 6th. Um, and this is the one that has the new amendment. Uh, so um, we also have someone in the audience with us today who can answer questions on the amendment for the committee if that's necessary. Senate Bill 34 authorizes the Attorney General or the Chief Legal Officer or other authorized representative of a political subdivision of the state to represent certain officers or employees who are summoned or subpoenaed to appear. If the person is not a named defendant, submits a written request for representation, or if the Attorney General, Chief Legal Officer, or other authorized representative determines that representation is in the best interest of the state. The bill also authorizes the use of special counsel if the Attorney General, Chief Legal Officer, or other authorized representative determines that it is impractical, uneconomical, or could constitute a conflict of interest to provide legal services. Additionally, the requirement that a determination regarding the use of special counsel be made prior to trial is removed, as is the prohibition against compensation being paid out of the state general fund. A person in the executive department is authorized to employ counsel other than the attorney general to represent the state or any agency in the executive department if it's determined to be impracticable, uneconomical, or could constitute a conflict of interest for the attorney general to do so. Um, the amendment, as I mentioned, uh, has been revised today. At the, at the initial hearing, the attorney general proposed an amendment um, which removed state legislator in section one of the bill and added the term political subdivision and replaced the term impractical with impracticable in section two. The new uh, amendment was submitted today by the Attorney General's office and it contains um, additional changes in section four of the bill regarding attorney or counselor compensation. And that's all I have, Madam Chair. Um, if you'd like to go through the amendment, um, now would be the time, thanks. All right. Are there any questions from members of the committee about the amendment or the work session document? Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Chair. What is the difference between impractical and impracticable? Why would we, I'm just curious. I've seen those words used and I, so he's changing that in the amendment. I'm just wondering, is there actually a legal reason for that? Or is there some, then we know, the, seems like it's the same exact word to me, which is slightly, Less Mr. simple Morton, syntax. Do you want? Thank you, Chair Scheibel. Mike Morton with the Attorney General's Office for the record. Um, it's a little different than syntax. Um, impractical impractical um, is not a legal term of art where impracticable is um, and so okay, so there, there is a legitimate reason to do it I never in fact as like you can't say it either and neither could I impracticable doesn't quite come out right but anyway thanks madam chair all right um, if there are no other questions I would accept a motion to amend and do pass so moved. 
All right, I have a motion from Senator Orenshaw and a second from Vice Chair Harris. Is there any discussion on the motion? I don't see any discussion, so um, all those in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed, nay. All right, let the record reflect that the motion has passed unanimously um, to amend and do pass SB 34 with the amendment as reflected in the work session document. Um, any volunteers to take the floor statement? <laughs> All right then, Senator Don Deraloop, you get the floor statement for your excellent pronunciation of impracticable. And um, I will turn it back over to Mr. Guinem to go through the rest of the work session document. Okay, thanks, Chair Scheibel. Patrick Guinan again for the record. Uh, the remaining bills are Senate Bills 37, 39, 190, and 223, and I will quickly uh, read summaries of those into the record. And uh, just uh, as the committee knows for the consent calendar, it would just be one motion, uh, which would be a due pass on all the bills if, you're, if the committee is in, uh, in agreement on that. So beginning with uh, Senate Bill 37, this is another Judiciary Committee bill on behalf of the Attorney General. It provides that an attorney employed by the state of Nevada or any agency or political subdivision of the state may act as a neutral third party mediator to help parties resolve a dispute or other matter so long as the attorney has the permission of his or her supervisor. The involved parties have no conflict of interest with the attorney's employer. The mediation is provided through or in association with an organization that provides such services. The attorney receives no compensation for such service, and the attorney complies with the Nevada Rules of Professional Conduct. Next bill is Senate Bill 39. This is another Senate Judiciary Committee bill on behalf of the Department of Indigent Defense Services. Uh, it was heard in this committee on the 9th of February. Senate Bill 39 provides that all records received by the Board of Indigent Defense Services and the Department of Indigent Defense De excuse me, indigent defense services are protected by attorney-client privilege and are confidential. Similarly, all records obtained or compiled during or after an investigation arising from a complaint related to attorney conduct are confidential except when releasing such records is necessary to the department's performance of oversight functions. The bill also sets forth circumstances under which the department may share information with licensing boards or other entities to the extent that information is not subject to attorney-client privilege, and it clarifies that the privilege privilege is not waived if a disclosure is made to the department in order to request prior approval for or to submit a claim for compensation or expenses or when submitting a complaint against an attorney providing indigent defense services. The next bill is Senate Bill 190, which is a committee uh, bill. It was heard here on March 16th. Senate Bill 190 exempts from incurring any civil or criminal liability a person who uses any reasonable means necessary to protect and remove a child or a pet from a vehicle that is locked or which otherwise offers no means by which to protect the child or the pet or to remove them from the vehicle. The person must report the incident to law enforcement or a 9-11 service, must stay with the child or pet and remain in close proximity to the vehicle until told by a first responder that their presence is no longer necessary and must cooperate with any first responder or law enforcement officer who renders aid to the child or pet. Final bill on the consent calendar today is Senate Bill 223, which was sponsored by Senator Harris. We heard it here on the 20th of March. It makes various revisions to statute relating to real property, including clarifying that a notice of pendency of an action or withdrawal or cancellation of such must be filed in each county where the property is located. Similarly clarifying that documents relating to a foreclosure or a trustee sale must be recorded in each county where any of the property is located. It clarifies that certain instances when a lien must be recorded. It exempts the occupancy of a seller who after the sale becomes a tenant of the same property for a brief period from the provisions of the Residential Landlord and Tenant Act. And discharges an escrow agent from liability in relation to a commission claim made by a broker against a seller. And as I mentioned, Chair, there are no amendments to any of these bills, and that's all I have. All right, thank you. Um, so we don't have our presenters back here on all of these bills, but are there any questions for presenters or sponsors who are here or our legal counsel? Any questions on any of the bills? All right then, I would accept a motion to pass uh, the consent calendar. All right, I have a motion from Senator Wynn. I have a second from Senator Stone. Any discussion on the motion? All right, not seeing any, all in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed, nay. 
All right, uh, the vote passes unanimously to send SB 37, 39, 190, and 223 to the floor. Uh, do I have a volunteer for the statement on 37? Senator Stone. Do I have a volunteer for the statement on SB 39? Senator Wynn. Uh, and I'll take SB 190, and I will assign 223 to Senator Harris. All right, that concludes our work session for today. Um, I am going to hand the gavel over as we take our uh, bill hearings today out of order and start with SB 418. Okay, as the chair just mentioned, we'll go ahead and open up the hearing on Senate Bill 418. Uh, chair Scheibel, go ahead and begin whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. My name is Melanie Scheibel. I am the state senator for District 9 in Clark County in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I am uh, delighted to bring SB 418 to the committee today. This is a committee bill um, that is intended to help provide voters with more information when they are electing their judges. Um, I have received a lot of feedback from constituents in my district, and I think many of you have as well, that voting for judges can be um, difficult or confusing because we don't know them very well. Um, and the rules for judges when they are campaigning are very different from ours. Uh, they can't stand up on a podium and tell us how they feel about uh, different provisions of the Constitution or different US Supreme Court decisions or uh, policy matters. Uh, they can tell us about their experience. They can tell us about their philosophy or their philosophical approach to the law. But um, it's just not as easy to get the kind of information that voters need about their judicial candidates as as it is for other candidates. So what SB 418 does is it utilizes something that already exists in the Judicial Selection Commission, which is a questionnaire. When there is a vacancy in a district court, um, when a judge retires or, or leaves, um, and, an, and a replacement has to be appointed, anybody seeking that appointment has to fill out a questionnaire. It's about, uh, I want to say, 12 pages long, and it includes information, biographical information, like where the candidate is from, where they went to law school, how long they've been practicing, and it also gives them the opportunity to answer some questions about their legal background and their legal career. Um, it includes questions about what percentage of their practice has been spent in various areas of the law. It gives them an opportunity to talk about some of the major cases that they've worked on and to provide other information that is helpful to the Judicial Selection Committee when they're appointing replacements for district court judges. SB 418 requires that anybody who is going to file to run for one of those seats also fill out this questionnaire, and then that the election official in that um, district make that available on their website. So um, every voter who goes to vote in a judicial election would be able to go to one centralized location, which is the um, official elections website of that jurisdiction, and read these questionnaires filled out by each candidate for a particular um, judicial department. And um, that is what the bill says. I do have um, an amendment that was offered to me by a uh, I very much appreciate from the Nevada Supreme Court uh, to clarify that there, when applicants apply for the um, appointment, there are parts of the application they fill out that are confidential, some uh, background checks and credit checks, things like that. They would not have to do that when they're applying, when they're filing to run for office in, um, in an, an elected position. Um, they would just have to fill out that questionnaire part that I previously mentioned. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Committee members, uh, Senator Stone. Thank you for the presentation. And I, I think this is great because you're absolutely right. We, do, we don't know a whole lot about judges other than their names and they can't weigh in on political issues. So I think the application process and being um, put on a registrar's website is really, really great. Um, as a part of that uh, application process, so would, a, would an attorney have to disclose that they've been sanctioned by the bar for any issues that the public would like to learn about, or is that going to be considered confidential? Uh, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, great question. I believe that is one of the questions on the questionnaire. Also, just so that everybody knows, um, you uh, bar sanctions are not confidential. Um, 
you can look up any attorney in the state on the state bar website, and if they've ever been sanctioned or disciplined, that information is publicly available. And I encourage everybody to do that before you hire an attorney or vote for a judicial candidate. So thank, thank you, you for bringing that up. Additional questions? Senator Wynn. Do you know if that application um, for appointment is posted anywhere mm. on any of these websites? Is it a document that I can go and look at right now? Yes, it is. And um, I can email you. I can. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's through the Judicial Selection, Selection Commission. I can email you a link to it. You, you know what? I see it right here. I just. Gosh, the Google. It's so good sometimes. It so really I, is. I did I did find it here. I was just curious Here's if there was. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Not seeing any. We will go ahead and open it up for testimony. Is there anyone here in Carson City who'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill four eighteen? Okay, I uh, don't see anyone in Las Vegas either. BPS, can you please check the phone lines for support? Thank you, Chair. If you would like to testify in support, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Again, if you would like to testify in support of SB 418, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no callers at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anyone here in Carson City who'd like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 418? Okay, how about down in Las Vegas? Still no one. BPS, can we check the phones for opposition testimony? If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 418, Please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no callers at this time. Great, thank you. Was there anyone uh, here in Carson City who'd like to testify in the neutral position? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Michael Hillerby, on behalf of the Nevada District Judges Association, here today neutral uh, only because at this point our members have just had a chance to look at the bill and are waiting for some feedback from them. I do want to thank the sponsor for last evening reaching out and letting us know the hearing would be today and sharing the amendment. So our members are reviewing that. We just couldn't move with quite the same alacrity as the committee. And for Senator Wynn, on behalf of our client Google, we're glad we could be of assistance. <laughs> thank you. I, uh Chair, Vice Chair Harris and committee, committee members, my name is Chase Whittemore. Um, right now I'm rep just representing myself, um, but I do have a lot of clients that are politically engaged in uh, judicial races um, and just would request a couple days to get with them all and uh, make sure that um, they're all uh, comfortable and supportive. I, I imagine they will be, but um, there might be actually be some favorable amendments hopefully but um we'll just leave it at that for right now thank you thank you still no one in las vegas uh, bps can you please check the phone lines for neutral testimony yes if you would like to testify in neutral for sb 418 please press star nine to take your place in the queue
there are no callers at this time. All right, thank you so much. Uh, with that, we will bring it back here. And uh, Chair Scheibel, if you'd like to make any closing comments. Thank you. I just want to say that I appreciate everybody being here and definitely happy to keep working with folks on amendments and uh, to their credit, I did just schedule this last night. So I appreciate everybody's flexibility during deadline time and look forward to working on making this bill awesome. Okay, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 418 and I will hand the gavel back over. All right, thank you. That takes us to our hearing on SB 252, which I will um, invite the presenters to the table for now and open the hearing. All right, uh, good afternoon to our Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and the amazing committee on judiciary. I am Senator Edgar Flores, proudly representing Senate District 2 in the state of Nevada. And uh, alongside of me uh, is Attorney Sean Claggett, uh, who is not only uh, a very well-respected human being, but he is uh, an attorney who is recognized nationally for the amount of work that he's put in, particularly in the subject matter that we're going to be engaging in today, which is focus groups. Um, I had the opportunity uh, during the interim, prior to coming in uh, to uh, this uh, session of the legislature, and I, as I often do, engage with constituents, community members, stakeholders, etc. And Within one of those conversations over vegan tacos, uh, I had an opportunity to sit down with Mr. Claggett and, and engage in some of the conversations of what's happening within the legal community and how we could potentially address some of those concerns. And then uh, with that, it's the genesis of this bill. Um, as you all know, uh, and, and I know that you've had an opportunity to review a little bit of what NRS 18.00 does. Um, but I would just outline that uh, the Nevada Rice Statute specifically addresses uh, recovery of costs by prevailing parties in civil actions uh, by allowing the, the prevailing party to recover reasonable costs incurred during litigation process, including fees, expert witnesses, transcripts, photocopies, amongst other things. Uh, one of the things that is very relevant when we talk about uh, attorneys is the standard of care, and I had an opportunity to discuss this with, uh, with uh, Mr. Sean Claggett at length, and there is a duty, there is a responsibility or an obligation that is placed on attorneys to utilize everything within their arsenal to advocate passionately in a cellular manner for the folk they represent. It is a duty, and anything beneath that um, is a disservice to the folk we represent. Whether you are on the plaintiff side or defendant side, that is the obligation put upon us as attorneys. Today, unlike years in the past, it is now almost a mandatory requirement for any legitimate law firm to engage in the practice in their plan. And there's a whole host of things that happen within a plan of representing uh, a, a client that you engage in the practice of focus groups. The reason this is necessary is focus groups very often have a benefit which avoids trial. And the reason for this is, say in a hypothetical, Sean is representing party A and I am representing party B, and we both engage in that practice, and in our representation, we both uh, engage in, in uh, conducting several focus groups. We may both come to the realization that I may have the stronger and winning argument or vice versa. 
And in that scenario, if we've made that determination, remember the entire objective of going uh, to trial is to make a human whole. That's the only reason we ever go to trial. That's the only reason there's an attorney involved. There is somebody that needs to be made whole. But imagine in a very contested issue that that could take years sometimes. If you can do anything as an attorney to reduce the amount of time to make that person whole, you have an obligation to do it. In that hypothetical that I just described, we may come to the realization that my argument is stronger or I have a winning case or vice versa. That's going to encourage us to settle because we come to that realization. That's why it's so important and it's almost an obligation imposed on all attorneys to ensure that they, they, they have focus groups. So because that is a common practice now, because it's what's happening in the state of Nevada, because other states have recognized it as well, we want to make sure that focus group costs are recoverable under cost in, under NRS 18.005. That's the entire uh, argument. That's why we're bringing this forth. I want to remind folk that this does not benefit one side over the other. Both uh, the plaintiffs and defendants uh, uh, use focus groups in their strategy. It, it's a part of a requirement. Um, I, I know there's going to be some folk in opposition, but I can't imagine any of the, one of them saying that their clients don't use focus groups. Of course they do, uh, particularly in big fights. Uh, I don't think any, there's any industry that wouldn't utilize every, every available tool uh, to, to their disposal. So with that, I'd like to hand over the presentation uh, to Mr. Claggett, who would just provide some deeper insight and some of the work that he does around this area. Please. Thank you, uh, Senator Flores. Again, my name's Sean Claggett. I thank you all for having this hearing and uh, learning more about focus groups and why they're used in the legal profession. Focus groups have been around for over 20, 30 years. 20, 30 years ago, very few lawyers utilized them. They were not understood and not used very often. Over the years, they've become the standard of care for lawyers, certainly in the last decade. We saw a big movement in roughly 2010, 11, where attorneys started being trained on both sides on how to conduct focus groups. Focus groups offer a party an opportunity to see how a jury will react to their case ahead of time. We use a phrase, uh, a term in our office, the worst thing a lawyer can do is have their first focus group be the jury. I sit not only uh, as an arbitrator, I also sit as a short trial judge. I teach at UNLV Boyd School of Law as an adjunct professor. And it, I'm always surprised to see certain cases go to trial. And I know uh, some folks have the belief there's too many frivolous lawsuits out there. And there's certainly frivolous lawsuits. I think nobody could deny that fact. But there's also frivolous defenses. And the way you weed through that is through focus groups. You may think you have a valid case, but if your focus group rejects your case, you know that that's a case you shouldn't try. And you need to make decisions early on. I have, in the last 10 years, been involved in very large-scale, large loss large cases where Everybody uses focus groups. Nobody goes to trial without a focus group. It would be malpractice to do so. And that's where we, w the standard of care now requires lawyers to engage in focus groups. Focus groups have also taken a turn where it's not just the live focus groups that you're seeing today. Technology has allowed great advancement in the technology that we're using as trial lawyers. There's also now big data focus groups, which has greatly reduced the cost of focus groups. Uh, the defense typically utilizes focus groups that are very expensive. And, and they come in the form of putting together 40 or 50 people in a room, and then you have an attorney play the part of the plaintiff and put on their, it's called a clopening, so it's like an opening with closing arguments. And they present evidence, uh, documents, whatever they think will benefit their case. And then somebody plays the defendant, and they do the same thing. And then they then break those groups into four or five deliberation groups, and they, and they record those deliberations to try to get a sense for how the outcome of the case will be. The problem is that the companies that run those focus groups do. They charge seventy-five dollars to $100,000 for that single focus group. It's very expensive. Um, the reason why focus groups have become more accessible is because we've learned how to conduct them for much more affordable. Um, 
but that's where big data comes in also. So the big data focus groups is able to take 500 people and get a focus group done for 25 to 30,000. And now you have 500 data points. And these data points are allow, allowing both the plaintiff and the defense to understand the risk, the true risk associated with their case. And so when you have knowledge, right, they say knowledge is power. And so why are we trying some of the cases that we're trying? You sit there and you shake your head. You're like, why is this case in trial? And maybe you say that because it seems like the case is so ridiculous from the, the plaintiff's standpoint. Like, why are you bringing this lawsuit? And there's other times where you're like, why is the defense trying this case? This is a massive case. Why would you do this? The reason is, is because they're not utilizing the technology and the information available to them. If we were to run big data focus groups, and I'm using this as, a, as, a, as an example, in a mediation, if both the plaintiff and the defense were to submit statements to the mediator, the mediator then sends those statements to be focus grouped in a big data format, the mediator would get back the win rate, how likely it is that the plaintiff will prevail, and a range of value. And then the parties can have a meaningful discussion about what fair resolution looks like. Trial is not designed to, to result in astronomical, mind-boggling numbers. It's designed to make the plaintiff whole or to vindicate a defendant who didn't do anything wrong, right? What's happening, though, is you see bad decisions being made routinely, whether it's from the plaintiff side or the defense side, to try cases that shouldn't be tried. And there's a lot of cases that we could get out of the litigation process earlier by this process. We have an ADR system in Nevada that I think does a great job, candidly. A lot of cases get resolved before trial, but there's a lot of cases that don't. And it's because focus groups aren't being utilized effectively by all parties. Um, many times they are, and I will tell you that we resolve a lot more cases today than we historically have because the defense is utilizing focus groups. And we understand the strengths and weaknesses of our cases more laser focused like. So we understand where we can win and lose cases. It's this type of use of focus groups that will prevent a vast majority of cases from going to trial. In fact, I believe and I have a book being published in the coming months about big data focus groups. It's, it's something that now big data focus groups is newer. That's been around only for f probably the last seven, eight years. Um, it, focus groups 20, 30 years ago were kind of in the same position. Not everybody was using them. Today, there, I don't believe there's a trial that really takes place in this state without focus groups where the parties are utilizing them. Big data focus groups is not there yet, but because it reduces the cost so vastly and you're able to get so many more data points creating a more accurate result, and we've predicted, just to, to, so you all can understand, we have been able to predict 38 out of 40 verdicts in jury trials accurately. Um, many of those have been my trials, um, but uh, the vast majority have been other attorneys' trials. So what it's telling you is that the facts matter. While it's true that an attorney can be completely unprepared and ruin their own case and hurt their client from being unprepared, those lawyers that take the time to, to be prepared actually the result is predictable because at the end of the day when you get enough data points you know where the result's going to be and so I, I was I'm a huge proponent of having focus groups be a recoverable cost because we need more lawyers engaging in the, in that process and what we really need to do is give the defense the ability to go to their carriers and say you know what this is if we prevail and we do this study and the defense rolls the dice and lose, they got to pay for this. And that's the way it works. We have the most robust offer of judgment laws in the country. If you want to go to trial in this state, you take a big risk. Because if you lose, your attorney's fees and costs of the other side are going to be paid by the losing party. And so we already have a system set up that says, listen, if you're going to go to trial, you better have all this information. There's a big risk if you lose. Somewhat appropriate in Nevada that you're going to take a big gamble if you do something, right? Well, we, we did that. In Justice Hardesty, uh, there was a ruling, a decision that came out of the Supreme Court not too long ago that talked about the cost. And, and the idea was, listen, we, we want more cases settling. We have too many cases 
in the pipeline. The state's gotten really big. There's a lot of people moving here, moving into Reno, moving into Las Vegas. And so we have to find ways to, to more adeptly reduce cases that go to trial. And the best way to do that that I know, and, and I've been a, a lawyer, trial lawyer for 20 years now, is the proper use of focus groups. And so we need to encourage focus grouping. We need to encourage this behavior because it will decrease the amount of trials and it will result in fair resolution to both sides, whatever that may be. And we've had cases that we've studied where it showed the plaintiff was going to lose. And we've told the attorneys that we've worked for and done these studies, you can't try this case. You need to resolve it. And those cases get resolved. Um, we've had cases where we've told the defendant, you're going to get crushed. You shouldn't try this case. It's going to get out of hand. And they haven't done their focus groups. And they take the risk ignorantly. And that's not right. That's not fair to their client. They're not doing their duty to their client going into a trial ignorantly about what the outcome is likely to be. We owe that duty to our clients. We owe the duty to our clients to tell them the risk, both on win and loss, and the risk on value. And if we don't do that, we have fallen below the standard of care. And the time has come that this is the standard of care. And so... Do you want to just cost now include? Oh, yeah. Uh, I will also add that many judges already allow recoverable focus groups to be recovered. M most of my trials, I get my focus groups recovered already. Uh, and the reason for that is that it's because it's the standard of care, it's no different than taking a deposition. It's no different than uh, doing an examination of a plaintiff on the defense side, with hiring experts. It's all in that same group. So it is the standard of care today. So it, it is not as if we're not already getting this done. It's just that the time has come to update the statute to the reality of where we are as a profession. Thank you. All right, thank you. I think we do have a couple of questions. I will start with Senator Wynn. Thank you. It's been a long time since law school, hasn't it, Sean? Um, I have a question about costs. I don't practice in this area of law, but I'm looking at these costs. Are these, if, um, are they, are they discretionary, mandatory? Like, who makes that decision after the conclusion of a trial? Sean Claggett, thank you. It has been a minute since law school. Uh, so right now it's vested in the judge and I think that's the right thing to do. The judge sits and presides over these cases and at the end, say for example, a concern can be, hey, this, this case was kind of simple, right? Why'd you spend $25,000 on focus groups? And the judge would say, I don't think that's reasonable. I think a focus group or two might've been reasonable, but I, that's what the discretion of the judge is for. And they're already utilizing that discretion. The judges understand. Uh, and do a great job of that. I think that we just rest that discretion now and we should in the future with the judge who's presided over the case and understands the complexities that were involved in the case to begin with. Other questions? Senator Orenshaw. Thank you very much, Senator Flores, Mr. Claggett, for presenting the bill. Um, like Senator Wynn, I don't practice in this area, but one question I have, you mentioned that focus groups on both sides for the plaintiff and the defendant might be able to encourage sides to settle if they don't think they're going to prevail at trial and save a lot of you know fees for the clients, the defendant, and the courts. And I'm just wondering, do you think that if uh, plaintiff and defense know that they can go to that focus group early on, it might additionally save resources that might be spent for expert witnesses, investigators, depositions, interrogatories, requests for production of documents. Do you think that if, if the sides see they either don't have a good defense or don't have a good uh, case, that there might be savings there too, not having to go hire those expert witnesses, not having to have those depositions, those requests for production? Sean Claggett, thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, we, we encourage early focus groups. In fact, at our firm, we do focus groups before we even file a lawsuit to see if it should be filed, right? Because we don't want to waste anybody's time. And certainly, once you have enough information to file a lawsuit, you will have the information necessary to run focus groups. And so early on, you can run focus groups, specifically when there's, and just to, I'm sure, most people on this committee understand, but there's initial disclosures in civil litigation. When you get those initial disclosures, you can then utilize that information to run a focus group, and you may realize off the bat that you have a big issue that you can't overcome. 
and then the case needs to be shut down. Or you may find out that if you're the defense, you have a major issue that you're aware of that you should settle the case, right? Like, for example, you don't have the logs for a truck driver. That could be a big problem for you in litigation. You should test that and say, hey, if it turns out that we can't produce this evidence because we don't have it, how does that impact us? Should we take the risk or should we settle? And so absolutely those costs would be avoided and should be avoided because there's cases that should settle early. And look, there are some cases that can't settle. There could be a variety of reasons why that happens, but at least you're educated going forward. But a lot of those cases uh, costs would absolutely be avoided through the proper use and early use of focus groups. Thank you, Mr. Claggett. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Other questions? Senator Stone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Like my two uh, other colleagues, I don't practice in this area either. As a matter of fact, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just trying to make a little joke out of this. But um, thank you. This is really uh, eye-opening for me. Um, uh, the cost of litigation is is, is exorbitant. And um, but uh, just a couple of questions. So the, the, the two attorneys, the, the offense and defense, they can stipulate that the that the prevailing party will pay for these, I assume, if they stipulate that the judge, I, I imagine, would honor that? Sean Claggett, I, I've never had that discussion with with any party. We, in, in the larger loss cases that I'm now handling, it's understood. I, I, okay. You have the ability, what ends up happening, I'm going to use Lee Roberts as an example. Lee's a phenomenal attorney that works on the defense side and, and, and handles a lot of large cases. Lee and I know that we're both doing focus groups. So we know at the end that if there's a prevailing party, then that's going to be paid by the, the losing party. So it's just one of those things that we know, but I've never actually had a discussion to okay. stipulate to that. Okay, thing. and then uh, you, you mentioned that this is now a standard of practice. So if you have an attorney that maybe have – has a losing case and it's recommended that they do focus groups and he says absolutely not we're not doing focus groups he loses uh, does that put him at risk for a malpractice case from his client saying that you should have known we were going to lose this thing and his, I spent thirty thousand dollars more than I probably should have Sean Claggett in my opinion and I believe I'm an expert in the field yes you have fallen below the standard of care and I believe that your client would have a cause of action against you for malpractice for not conducting focus groups Okay, good. And then my last question is, um, this is the first time I've heard of these types of focus groups before. Is there legislation governing the, the focus groups and their neutrality uh, and coming in to re review a case and their qualifications to review a case? How, how is that ascertained? I mean, you, I know uh, attorneys can bring in professional witnesses to further their cause in their cases. Is this an, another way for an attorney to pick a focus group that's going to give the edge to his client over the opponent's client? Sean Claggett, that is a great question. Thank you. Um, you absolutely can manipulate a focus group, 100%. That can be done. It serves no value to the person conducting the focus group to engage in that behavior. You want to know how you can lose. You want to know your risk. We, we, attorneys are hired for their judgment. And it would make no sense. Now, I will say that young attorneys that I teach on how to do focus groups oftentimes are terrible because they're scared to lose. They don't want to hear the bad. And we tell them, you have to embrace the bad. Take it in. Learn from it. Don't. And so what, happen, what you end up seeing with young lawyers is they'll go in and they'll do their first focus group and they'll just start advocating. And so there is, the, it's the person do, conducting the focus group, yeah, there is a level of education that needs to take place. As far as the partic participants, we do our best to get participants that reflect uh, the community in which the litigation is pending. So if we were doing a case, I have a trial starting Monday in Reno, we're going to get our focus group members from Reno. If we do it in Vegas, we're going to do it from Vegas. So th that's the what you would try to do on the live focus groups to make sure that you're you're having that but yeah there's there's no uh it's certainly attorneys could manipulate it but you're utilizing it for your own information um i i suppose you one could do that it would just be a complete waste of your own money to do that 
And, and, it, and it would you'd look kind of foolish saying, hey, I have done all these focus groups and I, I know I'm going to win at trial. Yeah. And you've messed them all up and then you lose. <laughs> I mean, you could do it, but it seemed kind of foolish. So uh, one follow-up, if I may ask one. Uh, it, it, the, the selection of the, of the focus group is kind of like uh, selecting a juror in a court where an attorney can veto a particular group for whatever reason and they have to come to a consensus on which one they're going to pick. So Sean Claggett, no, this is, it's better than a jury um, from the standpoint that in a jury, we're going to do jury selection and both sides get to deselect people. That's what I mean. Yeah. No, in yeah. a focus group, we take them as we find them, okay. the most random people. And so you may have somebody on your focus group who w wouldn't sit on your jury because they could say, I think every plaintiff is entitled to a bunch of money. Well, guess what? That person doesn't sit on a real jury. Conversely, you don't get somebody on the jury that's going to say, I believe that nobody should ever get any money for pain and suffering regardless of the facts. They don't sit either. But you get to hear from those people, hear what they think, and understand why they think, feel that way. And you start to educate yourself. And so the more that you start to understand, and, and I use this as an example. When I get ready to do a trial, I, I, I pain myself. I pain myself to watch both MSNBC and Fox together. <laughs> and it's painful uh, to do that. But the reason why you do that is you hear vernacular being used on the particular stations. And when you run your focus groups, it's educating you on those little things, those nuances as well. And there is a side benefit to doing photo, fo uh, focus groups for lawyers. It makes you a much better trial lawyer. We have so few trials in the state of Nevada that lawyers get to do. And oftentimes what happens is the, the, the attorneys that do trials, there's a, lot, there's a group of us that do a whole bunch of trials and then other attorneys don't do as many. Doing focus groups ahead of time will make them better advocates for their respective clients because they're comfortable in front of strangers. That goes for plaintiff and defense. And the, the defense needs this more because the plaintiff bar has done a pretty good job of conducting focus groups. And you see that the plaintiff bar probably is a little more comfortable in the jury selection process than the defense. The defense really needs to start practicing this more. Um, and they can do, utilize the focus groups to become better advocates for the, for the defense. Thank you. All right, any other questions from Senator Hansen? Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, under current law, you already have a provision where any other reasonable and necessary expense can be uh, part of the, the settlement agreement, I guess. Um, since the focus groups are already currently standard practice, are there certain judges that apparently, because I, I understand why you want to put it in, so it's, you know, no, no more up to the judge, but are there current judges that don't like focus groups? I mean, I'm kind of wondering why you, you actually need it in statute when it's already standard practice, and from the description you gave, it's a great idea. Thank you. That's a great question, uh, Sean Claggett. So, yeah, there are some judges out there. They rely. There's a case that's about 20 years old or so that talks about there was a request for focus group reimbursement, and the Supreme Court said, look, at this time, this isn't the standard of care. It may become the standard of care, but right now it's not, and so we don't think it falls under that catch-all. Now it is the standard of care. And so adding that as a line item reimbursement expense is, I think, prudent to reflect all the other standard of care that we see. What, what you see on those reimbursed costs make up the standard of care what's expected of a lawyer. And this is now within that category. And so I believe it's time that we, it's, it's getting the statute to catch up with the reality of what the standard of care is. It's a little bit behind and I think it's time to fix that. Yeah, it seems reasonable. Limitations on size. Is there any, like you mentioned, some giant ones, 500 people. I mean, you know, technically could that be considered a legitimate focus group and the other side gets billed for 500 people when 15 may have been more than sufficient? Uh, Sean Claggett, another really good question. So here's the, the cost of doing a big data focus group is way cheaper per person than a, a standard in-person focus group. And it, if you'd like, I, I, I'll actually give you an ex explanation of how this all kind of came about. I, I had been doing focus groups at a large case that went to trial back in 2016. And it, there was an issue of comparative negligence, and I had to figure it out. And we ended up running about 20 focus groups, and I created a software. My brother's really smart. He created software where we could take all the information we're getting from the focus groups and input it into the software to create what ended up being patterns we were seeing. And the problem with that is that that cost to do 20 focus groups was like $85,000. The verdict in that case was quite large, so it warranted the expense. But I only had, 
at the end of the day under 200 data points. We can now get 500 data points for a third of the cost. And so a 15-person focus group, it's good. It's better than nothing. It's going to help you. But in, when you do these live focus groups, what you find is you may have somebody that's very talkative and overbearing on people. And you have other people. They call them senators around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you, could, you, you have these people that are overbearing, uh, and you have other people that are quiet, and they don't like the confrontation. But those people that are quiet have just as powerful a voice on the jury as the people that want to be overbearing. And so in the live focus groups, what oftentimes happen is those people that are quiet, you don't hear what they really have to say. But in a big data focus group, because they're doing it in the sanctity of their own home, because they're doing these on computer, um, you get to hear what everybody has to say. And you get to understand how those people feel. And it, that's why the data becomes more accurate. And when you get to the point of about 400 or 500 data points, what we've learned over the last five years of doing this is that the outcome of the trial is very predictable. And, and once you know that, then we shouldn't have to go try the case. We should resolve the case. Uh, resulting in savings for everybody, in other words. The, um, last question, then, what's the average size and what's the average cost in your experience? So Sean Claggett again, thank you. So on a live focus group, our average size is 10, and that runs about 4,000 for four hours, about 1,000 an hour for a live focus group of 10 people. And that includes the recruiting of the focus group members, the payment to the focus group members, uh, the renting of the facility, that oftentimes people have to rent a facility to conduct the focus groups, and then uh, any additional overhead like lunch or drinks or anything else. So that's what makes up that cost. And then the presenter, whoever you're hiring as the professional to conduct the focus group is all encompassed in that. The when you do the clopenings with the 40 to 50 people and you do the plaintiff and defense side, you break them up, the average cost to that is $75,000. It's, it's, to me, that's cost prohibitive. I think that it it's, used to be the only way we could really try to figure out the outcome. One of the things that historically had hindered focus groups is that focus groups weren't really good at predicting value and outcome. In fact, when I learned to do focus groups 15 years ago, that's what I was told. Focus group's great, but it'll never tell you the value of your case. Data has changed all that. We now know what the outcome of the cases are going to be, and we know the values of those cases. And so that's, what's, that's the game changer. If you could understand if two parties split a cost of 30000 bucks, so it's 15000 bucks each, and they can know the likelihood of success for each side and the likely outcome of the trial, both sides would be crazy to do the trial. Why would you do that? Why would your clients take that risk? They shouldn't. I love the Seventh Amendment. Nothing means more to me than the Seventh Amendment. I believe that it's, it's, a, it's critical. Speedy trial? All of it. All The jury trial. It's a, the right to a civil jury trial. And it's critical, but at the same time, we owe a responsibility to our clients to tell them when they should go to trial and when they shouldn't. And that's what this allows us to do. Okay, well, it makes sense. I mean, uh, and plus, you always have a check that... Uh, judge ultimately can determine what is reasonable and if somebody gets carried away then nah, that doesn't make sense thank you madam chair thank you absolutely any other questions all right thank you so much for your presentation we will go now to testimony in support of sb 252 anybody wishing to give to support testimony in las vegas or carson city is welcome to the table now but not seeing anybody we'll go to the phones for testimony in support You would like to testify if you would like to testify in support of sb 252 please press star 9 in the queue there are no callers at this time all right then we will go to testimony in opposition to sb 252 Anybody wishing to testify in opposition is invited to the table here in Carson City or um, in Las Vegas. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Oops. OK, 
Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee, Paul Moratkin for the Vegas Chamber. The Chamber is opposed to, to the bill. We do have concerns about the additional costs. It will, will result in litigation from both sides of the of the court cases from the defendants and the plaintiffs. And as you heard, it is already allowed in discretionary of the judge. So again, we don't believe this is necessary and we are in opposition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Scheibel and committee members. Misty Grimmer with the Faro Group representing the Nevada Resort Association. Uh, we share the same concerns as the chamber. Um, it's no secret that litigation costs are already very high. SB 252 will artificially inflate the cost of litigation NRS 18.005 uh, provides a list of costs that are already recoverable. Each of these costs listed are things that are objectively reasonable and necessary in nearly every case, such as photocopies, postage, interp interpreter services. Focus groups are dissimilar because they are discretionary and not an essential part or a necessary part of the litigation. And as was already mentioned, and I think both the proponents and Senator Hansen also pointed out the judge already does have the discretion to include these costs if they believe it's a reasonable recoverable cost for the uh, prevailing party. So we think it should stay in the judge's hand and not be put in statute. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman. Cheryl Blumstrom for the Nevada Trucking Association. Um, for the reasons that my colleagues have stated, we also oppose the bill. Um, the cost of litigation is one of the most expensive things that we deal with as an industry. And in Nevada, the largest truck, or the average trucking company is four trucks. It's, it's not a big operation. And so to contemplate the added expense of a focus group as a necessary, if it proves to be necessary component, it makes the costs go up. And as those costs go up, the insurance companies will by their nature, add the cost of that to the cost of insurance for everyone. So for that reason, we are opposed. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Scheibel. Brian Walker with the Retail Association of Nevada. Uh, we would echo the comments of those previously in opposition. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel and members of the committee. My name is Jeff Rogan, representing Clark County. Um, during this discussion about focus groups, I want to remind you that also counties in the state and political subdivisions of the state are also defendants in many different types of lawsuits involving tort claims like Mr. Claggett represents. Um, we're a little bit different than these private entities that Mr. Claggett seems to, to, to reference a lot about. We're subject to statutory tort caps right now of about $200,000. Um, we also have certain immunities that private defendants don't have that apply to us. So we're in a little bit of a different circumstance. Um, and our concern with this bill, if it's included and applies also to political subdivisions, that'll incentivize the use of these focus groups, which as Mr. Claggett mentioned, are quite expensive on the, our smaller value cases. Again, $200,000 is the cap. These, what, what our research shows is most of these types of cases, most of these types of focus groups are used in larger value cases when we're talking hundreds of thousands or, or millions of dollars. If we start applying these costs to our political subdivisions, those costs will add up quickly. At $8,000 for a focus group, that's a significant cost. And again, we're not gonna use them because our evaluation of the expense of the focus group versus the potential um, damages that we would, we would be paying doesn't make economic sense for the county and for the taxpayers. So to the extent that these are justifiable in your view because um, both sides are using them. That's simply not true for the state and political subdivisions of the state. So we, we would ask that you either oppose this or more reasonably impose limitations of perhaps $3,500 when um, these costs are taxed against the political subdivisions of the state or the state. We already do that for expert witness fees in the statute if you take a look at uh, Chapter 18. So it's not something that's new or different. And that would be our request. Thank you very much. All right, I don't see anybody else uh, looking to give opposition testimony in person, so we will go to the phones, please. If you would like to testify in opposition to SB 252, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Uh, good afternoon, um, chair, Chairwoman and committee. Um, 
my name is Brian Partridge. I'm an attorney licensed in Nevada, and I'm here on behalf of the Creditors' Rights Attorney Association of Nevada. CRAN is a trade group of attorneys who represent creditors all over Nevada and all the courts from Main Street to Wall Street, and Justice Court to, to the Supreme Court. And so uh, we're interested in uh, costs as a matter of professional responsibility, uh, much like um, other presenters here today. But um, we're opposed. I'm here opposing SB 252 for most of the same reasons that have already been addressed. The one uh, issue we have is that the law already allows it uh, in the discretion of the court, and also professionally run focus groups are expensive to set up and manage and interpret. And there's nothing in the statute that requires any kind of safeguards. Or, or you know, requires the big data focus groups or anything else of that nature um, to give the court any kind of guidance on what would be a reasonable uh, focus group or how they should be organized or run. Uh, but essentially, this law would give people with deep pockets a blank check to convene at least one focus group to stress, 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 uh, stress test their strategies. And so, but poor parties won't be able to cover those initial costs. And that's not fair or reasonable under the circumstances. I, I note that Mr. Claggett, uh, who is obviously well versed in this area, has said, you know, hey, this is a standard of care. I think there'd be malpractice liability. Uh, I don't try $100,000 cases often. That, well, I've never tried one, honestly. But I've never used the focus group to tell me how my client should settle a case or whether they should. And I don't believe that's malpractice. I believe that the standard of care may be different depending on the type of litigation you're dealing with, whereas this statute or this proposed amendment would apply to every civil litigation case in Nevada of all types and shapes and sizes. And so, therefore, I'm opposed to uh, passing this bill. Thank you. There are no more callers at this time. All right, we will move to neutral testimony. Is there anybody wishing to give neutral testimony in person in either Las Vegas or Carson City? I don't see anybody, so we will go to the phones for testimony in neutral. If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 252, please press star nine to take place in the queue. Chair, we have no callers at this time. All right, then I'll invite the sponsors back up. If they, All right, then we are done with our hearing on SB 252. I will close the hearing. Thank you for being here today and for your presentation as well as answering our questions. That takes us to the last item on our agenda, public comment. If there's anybody wishing to give public comment in person, please come up to the table in Carson City or Las Vegas now. Not seeing anyone. We'll go to the phones for public comment, please. If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. We have no callers for public comment at this time. All right, then that brings us to the conclusion of our meeting. Um, we will be meeting again tomorrow at 1 p.m. And until that time, we are adjourned. <laughs>